please help me in giving a warm welcome to Shane McCombs. So I'd like to start out by saying I'm really glad we took the Nerf guns away from Chris, if you were in here for that last one. And we're actually doing something really great for the kids. Um, when the idea for speech about vigilantism, when he gave me that, I'm like, yeah, this, this won't be so bad. I think I can do that. And it's not going to be so hard. Well, once I really got into it, I was like, oh, good Lord. Just like this little guy here thought he was going to get a really easy lunch, I thought this was going to be an easy speech. No. In fact, I ended up feeling like that for a good part of the time I was putting this together. It's hard because it's difficult to get realistic statistics. It's a challenge. And frankly, this topic stirs up a lot of debate and it stirs up a lot of emotion. And so the goal of our conversation is we don't want to start debate. I do hope to get some emotion going, but we're not here to win an argument. The goal, get our thinking stirred up and maybe get us moved to some more action. So no debate, yes to the action. So challenging the thinking behind the vigilante style of predator hunting. When we review some of the challenges, and that's what we're going to do, that the vigilante style has and incorporates uh, into predator hunting, we want to be sure that we're doing this for the right reasons and that we're being able to help our children. So we're going to look at the challenges, see if there's a better way to address it. So why does vigilanteism stir us up? Why does it get us so emotional? I believe that it's because vigilanteism actually hits us at our core, at human beings. When something's not handled right, just think about this for a moment. I'm going to ask you a lot of rhetorical questions. When things are not handled properly, how does that set in your gut? It's just not quite right, right? Something's out of balance. So think about this experience. If you have a driver's license, have you ever had this happen to you? You let someone into traffic, and they don't even bother to do what? The little thank you wave, right? Why do we go, uh, mm. It's not a life-changing thing. Five minutes is not going to make a difference. Five years from now, it's not going to change your life. Why? Why did it hit you in your gut? Because your internal sense of justice was offended. You did something for them. What should they have done for you? You see, they should have done something back. In SE, we use this to our advantage all the time, don't we? Think about reciprocity. I give you something and even if it's unconscious, you know you need to give us something back. Those scales need to be balanced out. Now think about all the entertainment that we have that's based on vigilanteism. Give me a comic book hero who's a vigilante. Somebody. That's who I thought of. Batman, right. Why is this so successful? Because it resonates with us. So vigilanteism means something to us. This is the definition that we have, three key things. Law enforcement undertaken without legal authority and by a self-appointed group. So I have a question for you guys now. I'm gonna let you know it's an unfair question, okay? And uh, what I want you to do though is think about it. I'm gonna give you three seconds to come up with it in your head. What is the answer? And notice your gut, are you ready? Is vigilantism good or bad? That's it, go. Every single person, I heard someone say both. Every single person I talked to beforehand went, I think it's, wait, it depends on the circumstances, right? Because it's a really hard question to answer. And it's this circumstances, the never ending flow that adds a complexity to this style of a conversation that we're having. There's some really awesome research that's out there. I put the slide up. We really don't have time to go into it, but it is a really fun read. And uh, if you like this type of thing, I would highly recommend it. Because you and I, whether we realize it or not, are being affected every day by something called shadow vigilantism. This is a great story I wanted to tell you. The short story is this. See the truck? See how it shot up? There were 46 people who took, took part in that. To this day, that happened in 1981. 
To this day, the FBI still can't get one person of those 46 people to talk. Two feature-length movies, and on the plane over here, I looked up and I saw Sundance TV just released a two-part series on this. That was in 81, and it still has people's attention. That's why I think it appeals to our core. So, Robin's talk yesterday, and if we're being really honest with ourselves, we care about ourselves. How does this affect me? That's a question. So let's now take the concept of vigilantism and let's really focus it in on predator hunting. The chances of us as individuals and families being affected by this, it's growing. And it's growing all the time and it's very real. So let's talk about what our children are facing. I'm going to let you know we're going to go a little dark and I want you to think about this and try to put yourself in this place. So here's the question. In your head, how many children will experience sexual abuse before their 18th birthday? So in your head, I'm looking for a one in answer, right? One in 10, one in 100, one in 1,000, what do you think it is? You're probably all right, here's why, look. All legitimate studies, all things that can cause us. We see these numbers quoted all the time. So this seems to be very realistic, and this is what we'll use for the rest of this conversation. One in 10 children, statistically, is an acceptable, it's not a stretch to make that happen, right? Now let's just be frank. One in anything is too many. Are we agreed on that? This, come on, guys, this should never, ever be happening. That means that every person in this room has a 10% chance of you or your family being affected by this. So, that's one in 10 based against numbers that are reported. What do we know about people reporting? See, in real life, it's probably much higher, right? So, it's a real thing. So, ask yourself, what if I'm the one in? How would I respond? What would I do? Likely, you're going to go and you're going to seek help from a system that is designed to help you. Except, you get into the system and you find really good people. However, those people are understaffed, underfunded, overworked, and just like all of us in here, they're on that hamster wheel of technology and social media just trying to keep up with the next new thing that's coming out. So, what do you think the next question is you ask yourself? Hmm. I'm not getting the help I want. What am I going to do about it? So it's easy to see why the vigilante predators are starting to pop up. They're attempting to fill this gap to help out. This is a slide that shows very briefly about how this is starting to happen. These groups are starting quickly, they're starting fast, they're beginning to explode, and they are tapping our inborn desire for justice. If you're not familiar with this, here's the Predator Hunting 101. They initially will go in this general framework. They pretend to be a minor, they go out on social media, they will build a relationship with anyone. They'll cast this wide net out there, anyone who will interact with them. When, if the relationship turns sexual in nature, it's cultivated, and then we come upon an in-person meeting. The meeting is recorded or live streamed, and the person is what? Confronted, named, shamed, humiliated by members of the hunter group. It's typically what you will often see. And then what happens next depends on the group. It's anybody's guess. Does law enforcement get involved, et cetera? So that's the, the framework of it. So let's talk about some of the challenges that these types, of groups, these types of groups will face. Let's talk about physical safety. Who in here has seen these types of videos? Okay, just a few of us. If you choose to watch one, physical safety for everyone involved in that situation becomes incredibly apparent almost immediately. But here's something that's not so obvious. And I would like for you to think about this, because remember, law enforcement often is not involved. 
If an arrest is not immediate, what might that predator go back and do? He's been humiliated, shamed. He's not in a good mood. What might he do if he goes back and he has access to a child? Yeah, yeah. Not a, not a pretty thing to think about, right? Safety for all is really, really important. Questions of compatibility, capability. Are they able to gain a conviction? We see this challenge over and over. It's a legitimate challenge. Now we're gonna give this a shot, see how this video plays, and I'm gonna to attempt to interrupt it here in the middle, and we'll see how that goes. I've had varying success, but listen Praise closely. Praise paedophile hunters, as their methods could compromise the suspect's trial. In most of the cases I've dealt with, the prosecutions failed. Not because my client was innocent, it's because the, the witnesses, the paedophile hunters, went too far and that the court could not say that had it not been for their direct acts, would this person have actually done this anyway? The group. So I couldn't get it to stop in the middle. But did you catch what he said? Prosecution has failed. This is a common theme. Why? This guy even told you, the guys he's representing, that they're guilty. He just said it. But they couldn't gain a conviction because there was no capability with the group that was attempting to do this good work. So, and by the way, apparently guilt no longer seems to be enough, right? This is the world we live in. It's a challenge. All right, questions of legality. Guys, this never seems to end at all. These two screenshots are for the police telling they are being told to crack down on the vigilante hunter group, not the pedophiles. It's interesting, right? It's a great legal debate. What's the other huge legal debate about this? The question of entrapment seems to never go away, right? Everybody goes, oh, I was entrapped. I would have never, I would have never done that. Less than 60 days ago, this is from the Michigan Attorney General. Jeopardizing police work is a challenge. She, she comments, I know you're well-meaning, but essentially this is a cease and desist order because you're getting in our way. Please stop doing this, is what she's asking. Really? Legal protection for the hunters? We have pedophiles. We have people who are, we're saying they're pedophiles, now turning around and suing the hunter group. Think about that one for a minute. But it's a challenge that we have to deal with. Questions of effectiveness. Now this one could go many different ways. There's a lot of different groups, different ways we can look at this, different metrics. One of them, as we've already seen, is the challenge that they're saying that they're causing more work for law enforcement, right? So not only does law enforcement have to go out and try to get the pedophile, they also have to try to keep the vigilante group under control. And then what's that do to the resources? Starts draining resources, right? Because now we're causing extra work. That is a challenge, that is another theme that we see. Here's one that's more obscure, but I would love to see more people focused in on it. When you focus awareness on just a small slice of a much larger problem, what's the side effect of that sometimes? The larger issues tend to get overlooked and a lot of times underfunded. When we're in the realm of the vigilante predator hunter groups, most of that focus is on who? It's a stranger, right? The guy's gonna come and get our kids, he's a stranger, and we're going to, to hunt him down. The numbers, they don't support that, no matter how you slice them. Sadly, most of this comes from family members and from acquaintances, not the stranger. Finally, does the vigilante method teach sexual predators how to get better at hiding from the vigilantes and also from law enforcement, okay? When these guys go on Facebook and they go out there and they go full on open kimono and they show them how they're doing everything, because it's all out there, you can see how they're doing it. All you're doing is teaching these guys how to avoid them, 
right? So we never want to educate a predator. It's a challenge. So it's easy at this point to get caught up in arguments. Is vigilanteism right or wrong? In the beginning, I heard answers on both sides. I'm for it. I'm against it. I think it's good. I think your stats sucked. I don't agree with that. Look, the right question, I think, is this. Is there a way to just cut through the static, avoid all of those off-ramps and challenges, and just get on with moving these predators off the street? Is that a better question? I think we can do that. And at the Innocent Lives, we think the answer is yes. We can do that and avoid, by default, a lot of these challenges if we adjust our behavior. So that's the part where I want you to really start, I want to challenge you to think about this. We're attempting to build a very different non-vigilante framework that addresses a lot of the challenges. It doesn't do away with all of them, but it helps to address them. Let me share with you what I can about what we're doing. And this is actually a really good reminder at this point. If you ask a question of us and our response is, I can't share that with you. Even if I've known you for years, you may hear me say, I can't share that with you. It's not about trust. It's not that you're a bad person. It's about keeping kids safe, right? It's about not open kimono and not sharing everything. These were the challenges that we addressed. This is what we're building with the ILF framework. So one of the first things that we're doing is this principle of trying to remain as anonymous as possible and avoid confrontation. Now that's actually the opposite of the vigilante type process, correct? They're all about in your face and getting out there. So if we can catch these guys by remaining primarily anonymous and avoiding confrontation, that means most of the physical safety stuff is done away with. We've got it out of the way. Think about that little kid at home. If, this, if we're doing it right, Predator never has any idea he's getting, he's getting taken out. Kid is in good shape. What about the threat of legal action taken against the hunter group? We're not out there breaking the law. We're working within certain boundaries. So that helps to go away. What about being effective? It keeps us out of the courtroom which is really important to us, and it keeps us focused on our mission of getting these guys off the street. That's why we're here. And also, we're not teaching the predators to hide from us. So it really has a lot of possibilities. And finally, let's talk about capability. When interaction is within the scope of an engagement, how can we minimize the opportunity for failure on our part? by only using trained, qualified, and approved members of the team. If you want to interact, you're going to have to qualify. And we're working right now to see what that looks like. So it's not a simple thing, but it's getting addressed. It's odd wording. I couldn't come up with something I was really happy with. I was wanting to use target selection, and it sounded a little cold. But we're going after confirmed predators. Okay. Instead of casting that wide net and just letting whoever it is that comes back in, let's face it, the internet is full of a bunch of bad guys doing horrible things in public space. They're already, they've already broken the law, and they think they can hide behind a username. And guys, if there's any group of people in the world that knows that you can't hide behind a username, it's the people here. Let's go get the guys that are already misbehaving and get them out of there. When we do that, we get to bypass the questions of legality and entrapment. Finally, another opposite of the vigilanteism movement, cultivation of relationships with law enforcement at all levels. When we at the ILF, when we're able to focus our strength, you guys, the guys that know how to go out and hunt effectively, then... We focus that on confirmed predators, submit the information through a standard predefined and approved process to law enforcement. We can eliminate or drastically reduce a lot of the challenges that we've already been reviewing today. It just kind of bypasses many of those and lets us get focused on what we want to do. 
But it's also, it's not just about reducing the challenges. We've also had some really nice benefits that are starting to surface with this engagement with law enforcement. Finding the good people within the system. Guys, there are good people out there who are working hard to save our kids. We're beginning to connect with them. We're starting to build relationships and work in cooperation. We're listening to advice. They're helping us get better at what we're doing. We're also starting to receive invitations to speak directly to large numbers of law enforcement. Chris and I are leaving from here to Dallas immediately after because we've been invited to speak at a conference where there's going to be over 5,000 members of law enforcement there. Our goal is to be sure that they understand our concept of the framework and how we can benefit them to help save more kids. Instead of running the ILF as a nonprofit, sorry guys, I can't see my timer. Um, instead of running it as a vigilante group, we have made the decision to run it as a business, as a nonprofit. We are incorporating standard operating procedures, building best practices. We have a board of directors that is diverse and involved. We're building technology in house. And we have technology that we're talking to other people about that is just absolutely brilliant. We have a wellness program. If you're going to come in and you're going to volunteer for us, we need to keep a good close eye on your emotional bandwidth because you're rolling on a muck all day long. It's hard. It's really hard work. Finally, we have ridiculously stringent onboarding qualifications. And we're going to talk about that in just a second if you choose that you think you want to volunteer. So now it's time for a reality check. Guys, we don't have all this figured out. We're still learning. We're still trying to ask the right questions. We're trying to ask better questions. We're trying to learn from our mistakes and the mistakes of others. We will continue to look for better answers and we will continue to ask questions. That's the only way we're going to get better. So I've got a question for you guys now. Hopefully the goal of the talk has been reached. I didn't want to stir up any debate. I think we managed that. I don't see anybody in here angry. Did we stir up your thinking? That was the goal. Do we get you to think about this in a different way? If you think that you can get behind what we're doing, literally the rest of this is up to you. We're right back to this question. What am I going to do about it? Is usually this conjures up two primary questions. And the first one is volunteering. Now, I am going to go through this very quickly. Thank you for moving. Good job. What does it take to volunteer for us? Obviously, you have to have the desire, the time, the talent. We ask that you be over 21, and you are required to follow our wellness program. It's not optional. You'll fill out a contact form, you request a volunteer. If there appears to be a fit when we have openings, we'll reach out and contact you. We're going to go through a prerequisites interview. We're going to tell you what to expect. We're going to have you sign a volunteer agreement. It's basically an employment agreement at zero dollars. And then we are going to put you through a background check that is so intrusive it's embarrassing. Sometimes it's rough for us because we're like, sorry, we got to do this to you guys. But kids are involved. It's worth it. We're going to be looking at your criminal background, financial. We're going to be looking for some appropriate access to medical for our wellness program. And you also have to have a willingness to be known to law enforcement. Okay? Get through that. Okay. Sorry. You're still not done. We're going to do a technical interview. Do you have the technical chops to pull this off? We're going to do a wellness interview. Do you have the emotional bandwidth? Can you roll around in the muck and can you stay healthy and still stay good with your family and everything's good? In addition to all that, we're also looking for personality fit within the organization. Finally, guys, we are a nonprofit, right? You knew there had to be a donation slide up here. So how can you help? Obviously, if none of those things fit, you can. Please donate for us. Stop by the booth. Donate for some swag or just make a donation. 
You can also go to the website, one time or ongoing. We just nailed this up last week. If you like really nice sports clothes and you'd like to see it customized with an IELTS logo or your name on the back, visit our Squad Locker store. We get a slice of that. Every bit helps. What about OPM, using other people's money? Doesn't all have to come from you. If you already use Amazon, dude, guys, just make us your charity of choice and start going to smile.amazon.com, all right? And guess what will happen? They will give us money from Amazon. It doesn't cost you guys a thing. Benevity, are there workplace options? Will work help match your donation? Please check that out for us. Are you an author? Are you a game developer? Could you work with Humble Bundle? We can help you. Are you a Twitch streamer who's happy to do charity work? Can you talk to us, please? See if there's a good fit. See, those are your talents that you can give of. What about engaging your personal network? Do you have a connection to a celebrity that might be willing to do an Omaze fundraiser with us? I promise you someone in here does. There's a connection there somewhere. You know a philanthropist that our mission would resonate with? Ask them to talk to us. If we're a great fit and they've got money and it all works, awesome. If not, no problem. But it doesn't also, it doesn't have to be that complicated. Think about this. We've had a Twitter challenge to friends. We have someone in here who's selling t-shirts in an online store. And we had someone that put out a jar at a Super Bowl game. Three things. Those guys raised $4,000 for us. Complete surprise. We had no idea any of this was coming. So it doesn't have to be this huge thing you have to give up, right? So, did we meet our challenge? Are you thinking differently? I can't answer that for you. I hope you are. Most importantly, thank you, thank you, and thank you for all of your support. Okay, so it looks like I've got time left, two minutes. Okay, any questions? I will do my best to answer them. Yes, go for it. So that is a perfect question. The goal is to make this self-sustainable and scalable. So right now we're working through these challenges, we're figuring out the SOPs, and then our goal is to be able to stamp it out. Start adding people, adding people, adding people, right? So to, right now, I, I can let you know that last year we had nine cases that were submitted to law enforcement. This year already, before we got here, we're at 63. It's, thank you. It's a little dent, but you gotta start somewhere, guys. And this is, this is what we're doing, and we think this stands a better chance than the other method. Does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions? We've got one more minute left. Okay, yes, sir, go. Mm-hmm. All right, so um, we are not working with them directly. We have been taking some great advice from them and we have some working relationships. Uh, did that answer your question appropriately? Okay. Okay. They do. Right, so the question's about uh, NIGMIC, right? And, okay, so we're not working directly with them. But there are, because they have that database, there are some really cool platforms out there that are beginning to tie in, we're gonna be able to take advantage of and work with. So hopefully we can tell you more about that later. Sir, in the green? Yes, sir. 
We are currently at 26. That includes the six board members, and we have uh, 11 at the moment in the pit. That's our predator identification team. Okay. And I have six seconds left. Guys, thank you very much for sitting here and listening to this. I really appreciate it.